so I was blessed and had a privilege of growing up in a home that loved God, grew up in the church, came to the Christ very young age, and I am so, so grateful to God for uh, that opportunity I have. I remember in, in high school is, is really when uh, I just had some people in my life just coaching me and mentoring me and, and really kind of discovered my own personal quiet time. I don't know if I call it probably just devotional time is what I probably would have called it at the time. And, and it was simple. It was short. It was a devotional reading, maybe a verse or two of scripture, a few moments in prayer before I'd go off to school. And it, and it was a very rich and meaningful time for me. I, I look back and it was very, very simplistic, and it was, but it was just a very sweet time with the Lord. And as I was growing in that, I remember um, throughout the school year, uh, kind of that first time really engaging in that discipline of, of a consistent prayer life and, and devotional life. Um, I remember getting through that first school year and, and, and heading off in the summer and thinking, man, I'm, I'm kind of excited. It's like spiritually speaking, I'm kind of excited for this summer. Um, here in just busyness in school, I, I just stayed involved in just lots and lots of things and sports and all the extracurriculars and all the high school stuff and, and uh, stayed really f- full schedule. And I remember getting into the summer, and you know, it's, I'm a high school student, right? So summers are fun and exciting, and I, mean, I have all kinds of time, and I'm really excited to have my, my, my quiet time with the Lord. And what I realized was summer after summer after summer, my, my time with the Lord tanked in the summer. And I know this is regularly, but it, it's opposite. Like, I have more time than I've ever had in my life, but... Um, now all of a sudden, that quiet, and then I get back into school year, and my schedule fills back up, and I jump right back into this regular discipline of quiet time. I'm like, man, this seems odd. And here, 20 years later, I find the exact same patterns. It's not necessarily the summer anymore, uh, but, but it seems as if my time with the Lord ought to thrive when I have plenty of time available, and it ought to be stressed when I'm fully active. It's, it seems as if that, that a threat to my quiet time would be overly active, but what I found to be true in my life is that the greatest threat to my quiet time in high school and still today is not an overly active life, it's an overly idle life. And... Um, so I, I, I want to talk about that a little bit today. One of our core values here at Crossroads is that we are completely dependent on God in prayer. We are completely dependent on God in prayer. Now, I know we hear that and go, okay, yeah, 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 I get it. I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to pray. I get it, right? We, we've heard it before. I'm a Christian, therefore I pray. But if I really were to dig a little bit deeper, and, and even if I take the pressure off of all, if, I just, if you were to dig a little deeper in me, you would find, even though I'm a Christian, shoot, I'm a pastor, that this thing, this prayer thing is really hard. At least it is, it is for me. There might be some like spiritual giants in here, and based on what I'm going to say today, you're probably going to try to like, find another church because I'm not spiritual enough to lead. But, but if I'm going to be really honest with you, like this is hard. Prayer is hard. And, and it, doesn't come, it doesn't come very natural to me and to most of the people that I know, to be honest. Um, and yet I know that it's, it's good. I know it's healthy. I know, I know I'm supposed to do this. And I know it, it does great things in, in the kingdom of God. But if, if I'm going to be really, really honest, it's, it's challenging. I, I don't pray frequent enough. I don't pray like, like long enough when I do pray. I don't pray with enough fervency. And, and I'm just like, man, I, it's hard. And I know, I know there's probably some of you the encourager gift, right? Or you're going, oh, pastor, it's okay. You're doing a great job, right? We've got to be careful a little bit. I see this a lot in the church, is, is, uh, is, is we like to, and, and I think it's birthed out of the right heart, right? We see somebody say, I'm struggling in this area, or I'm not engaging in this particular area of my life in the capacity that I desire or that the Bible lines up. And what we do is say, oh, it's okay. God loves you, knows your heart. He does know my heart, and that's why I need to pray more. (laughs) 
Um, and, and there's an element to where we got to be careful that we don't, we don't passively dismiss misalignment with the Word of God. Because here, with, with each of the values we've been looking at over the last several weeks, and we'll kind of refresh those here in a moment, but with each of the values we looked at, they, they serve as a guidepost, as a, as a plumb line even for our lives where we can say, yeah, this is, we, we state them that we are, right? But to be really honest, some of them are, are more goals than they are descriptions, right? I'm completely dependent. Complete is a big word. <laughs> Completely dependent on God in prayer. It is, is a plumb line. And I'll be honest, this week as I was preparing f- to t- discuss this topic, as I held my life up against this plumb line of what I see in Scripture, I realized that there was, some, there was a gap. And before we, and it's easy to say, oh, pastor, I know you pray, you're, you're fine. Or before I say the same to you, hey, I know you're trying really hard. Listen, I, I, I'm not, I don't come on like, the verge of depression or walking in condemnation, but I just I want to see reality. Here is what I see in Scripture. Here is where I am. I've got to narrow that gap. And I believe that is what we're called into, is to a life of following Christ and if this is the way Jesus prays, and this is the way that I pray, I'm going to keep, I need to, I need, I need to keep taking steps to align myself with Christ. We are completely dependent on God in prayer, but it's hard. I need to work on the frequency. I need to work on my duration. I need to work on my fervency. It's hard. I, I uh, you guys been watching the Olympics? I love to watch the Olympics. Even the like boring events are cool. Like right, like it's just all the nations and it's just the backstories. And I love, I love to watch the Olympics. And one of the commercials, if you're watching the same channels that I'm watching, one of the commercials, and I'm sure you've seen it if you watch very much Olympics, they keep on playing a lot. The Samsung commercial of all of all brands, Samsung commercial, and it starts out with a teacher in a classroom writing on the chalkboard. Have you seen this one? And it writes can't. Well, actually, can, then adds the apostrophe T, can't. And then there's this mantra, this chant that you hear as it can keep going from clip to clip. Can, can't, can, can't, can, can't. And they, they show people who are, who are struggling and, and, and not making it and people telling them they can't. And then, you know, obviously, I don't even know how the whole commercial goes, but somehow with the help of Samsung, they can, right? Yeah, like, uh, that's uh, essentially, essentially how the commercial goes. Um, but at one point, there's this one moment where the screen's black and just in white text pops up this statement, do what you can't. Now, some of you, you're very black and white thinkers. You're like, that's stupid. You can't do what you can't by definition, right? <laughs> that's dumb. But when I saw that, actually, my wife and I both looked at each other and were like, this is the new Swihart motto. Do what you can't. Because there's, there's a line that, that, that gets stated over and over and over in our household by a, a couple of our girls in particular. It's a statement, I can't. It drives me nuts. And it's the simplest little things that they've never attempted before. They attempt it one time, doesn't really work, or it doesn't happen easily. Therefore, they brand that activity as I can't. And I, I get it. I'm the type of guy that if I'm going to do something, I want to do it well. And so if I fail the first time, um, I... I, I don't want to try it again, or else I'll wait till everybody leaves, and then I'll fill, and nobody can see me until I'm proficient, right? I, I get, I understand that, uh, but I feel, now I'll, I'll put it this way, I'm also the type, not the type of guy that says, you can be anything that you want to be. Like, we all have human limitations, right? There, well, there's limitations on us, but I believe that we oftentimes, we set the, our own limitations significantly lower than what is possible possible to us with that statement, I can't. So I love that. Do what you can't. That's what the Olympics are made of, isn't it? People breaking records all the time. Things that were said to be impossible you can do. Now, I want to look at this from a, a, a spiritual formation perspective. See, there are people with certain things. We're talking about prayer today. Prayer is hard, right? Prayer is hard. There's people, in fact, I heard an amen from one of my favorite prayers. I love praying with Rodney and Melinda. And Melinda's amening prayer is hard. I'm like, really? She does it so well. <laughs> um, 
But it affirms this, this idea that, that Olympic medalists weren't just like born and it just came really, really easy. They worked at something until they did what they couldn't do. There's an element of our spiritual development. When we look at the Word of God, listen, I can't. I can't. Right now, so many different things in here. I just can't. I'm not wired to be able to do these things. It'll come natural for me. I can't. And yet I am called to do. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do until I can. Because, because spiritual formation is not a 24-hour process. It is not a it's not a one-year process. Someday I will stand before God with eternity in front of me, and, 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 and I'm going to continue to grow in spiritual formation. I'm going to not look till tomorrow or next week or next year, but, but someday I, I'm going to look 30 years down the road. Be like, I want to grow into who God has designed me to grow into. Okay? So there's some things that I'm not good at right, right now. Like I'll just be honest. Like prayer. Sure, I pray. But I'm not where I want to be. When I look at Jesus, there's a big gap between the way he prays and the way I pray. And I want to shrink that gap. And so even though it's not easy for me, and even though it's not natural for me, and even though I sometimes I just don't want to, like I need to do until I can. There's, there's a certain element of our spiritual formation that, that sometimes we try to make it really spiritual, right? I'm just going to do when, when I feel prompted by the Holy Spirit. Ah, and pfft. You never will. Like, that's what you just said. Like, I never will. It, it, there is an element of our spiritual formation and alignment with the likeness of Christ that requires discipline. Well, I'm not a disciplined person. I can't. Stop it. Yeah, you can. You're like, I don't really have a, a prayer life. Okay, okay, that's fine. Let's evaluate where we are. Now let's take some steps. Set aside 10 minutes. 10 minutes. We just say, this time every day, I'm just going to pray for 10 minutes. I don't want to pray for, but oh, this, is how, this is how it works. You just say, I'm going to pray at this time, and then you show up and you do it. Okay, you're like, that, Pastor, this is super unspiritual. Do that for a year, and let me see if you're still praying for 10 minutes. I bet you it's going to be more than that. And I bet you're going to actually like it. Sometimes we just have to, it's, it's, it's not called legalism, it's called maturity. That we discipline ourselves to do what we currently don't want to do so that we will be able to do what we can't. So there's, there's an element that, that I look at me, and, and again, this is, this is real this week stuff, and I was like, God, all right, I gotta, I gotta revisit this. I've got a time where I pray, but I've become lax, and I have missed appointments of prayer, if you will. I'm being honest. This is this, and I, I've got to become more disciplined in the area of prayer. Oh, I'm not a disciplined person. Well, then that let's start there. Then show up for your appointments with the Lord, and let's work on this because we're not going to get there overnight. But but friends, by the grace of God, let's move forward and see see great things happening through our lives as we align ourselves to him through disciplined action. Okay, that's the rigid part of it. But there's a certain element where you go, okay, listen, that just lacks authenticity. I, I don't want a prayer life that's just like, I, I feel like I'm forced to, or that feels legalistic, or I, 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 there's got to be something more than this, just this. It lacks authenticity. How do I learn to pray more passionately. Okay, I can, I can, I can force myself to, to create a list and then pray, uh, you know, take off these, those things on the list for 10 minutes. I can, I can do that. But how do I pray more fervently? How do I pray where I, it seems like I actually mean it? You know what I've, what I've observed in my own life? If I just think back on, on some of the moments in my life, again, I, I just want to share where I'm at and where I've been, and hopefully it's helpful. Um, what I've observed in my life, the times of greatest prayer, there's, there's kind of two different areas. One of them is um, in my moments of, not all of them really, are moments of greatest need. What I've discovered is need is one of the greatest catalysts to prayer. I, I think back to uh, um, actually being freshly married. I remember our... our 
I mean, we were we didn't have money. I, I was making like $100 a week working in the gym and playing basketball, and Beth was working and living in a little cheap apartment and just trying to... It was just life. We were just young and in college and whatever. We're poor. Who cares? Well, um, and but it was it was tight. And I remember one time where you know we're watching our budget, right? We we missed a sixty dollar payment, right? And let's be honest, in college, like your bank account never gets over a hundred dollars. So you miss a sixty dollar payment, and and that's a big deal. And then we made a ten dollar payment, which we did not then know dropped us into the negative. We continued to use our debit card on on little dollar, two dollar items about six to eight times in the negative. Banks don't like that. So I remember getting a phone call from Beth, who was frantic, because we were in the hole over half of what we made in a month. And I remember I was at work. This is the church right now, interning. I, I, I left my desk. I found a room that nobody was in, and I prayed like I hadn't prayed because I was scared. There was an authenticity to my prayer there was a fervency to my prayer because I, this newly married guy, have no way to pay my rent next month because of the hole that I dug myself into because of bad accounting. And there was this fervency, this authenticity. Need is an incredible catalyst to prayer. I remember even earlier than that, having a moment when I was in Bible college and I, I, I couldn't afford the next payment. Like I, I had all the loans and everything I could get. I couldn't afford to get it there next semester. And, it, and I think I've shared the story here, but literally within the last 15 minutes of the office closing on the day that I had to have the money and God provided. But I, I remember even leading up to it. It wasn't even fear. It was just this, this dependency on God that, that I was, I was, I was wa- doing I, what I knew he had asked me to do. So I had confidence that he was going to provide for it. And my times of prayer in the weeks leading up to that moment were rich and fervent. Need is an incredible catalyst to prayer. Here's the problem. Matthew 19 is the problem. Matthew 19, and I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just reference it for you. Most of you are familiar with it. Jesus says this. He says it's really, really hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And then he says, in fact, um, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. You've heard this before, right? A camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And, you know, some people, they want to argue about what the eye of the needle is. That was a gate in the wall and a camel had to, like, bend its head to low and get on one knee and, and a, a humble posture to get through it. Maybe Jesus is talking about that. I don't care. Uh, if he was talking about that, what he meant was it's really, really hard. I tend to think that he meant what it sounds like he meant, that it's harder, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a sewing needle than it is to enter the kingdom of God. But either way, which however you want to interpret it, that's fine. What Jesus was saying, and I think sometimes we get so caught up in the, in the metaphor that we forget like, what he's trying to say. What he's saying is that it's somewhere between incredibly difficult to impossible for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And that, that's fine for most of us, right? Because we're like, oh, phew, good thing I'm not rich. Um, <laughs> right? That's our normal, normal posture when we hear that verse. But let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. If you had the opportunity to put your name in a hat with every other person on the face of the planet in the history of mankind, if you were to drop your name in the hat, shuffle it up, stick your hand in there and pull out another name, and trade lives with them, would you do it? I know some of you go, oh, man, the chance to be a billionaire? Sure, I'll try it. If you just take the world today, <laughs> you'd have a 50-50 shot of, of living on $2 a day or less. 50-50. You'd have a 1 in 7 approximate, approximate 1 in 7 shot of, of drawing a name that is in extreme poverty. I know you're like, I thought $2 a day is extreme poverty. No, no, no. I'm meaning not having access to basic needs essential to human life. That's not to mention the countless centuries before like the way that we use modern use of electricity or plumbing or transportation. So now I ask again, would you put your name in the hat? What does that mean? 
it means that Jesus wasn't talking to 2018 United States of America when he said it's easier for a camel to go through Ivan than a rich man to get to heaven. He was speaking about global humanity. So Jesus said, it's, hard, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for you to get to heaven. He said, it is hard for me to make it to heaven. I mean, shoot, even a homeless person today, and I, I don't want I, I to downplay real life need today, but even a homeless person who lives in Lincoln, Nebraska today is wealthier than most of the world just because they have access to opportunity. I could lose everything I have today and I could rebuild it because we live in a land of opportunity. And we have, we have the, the ability to have our basic needs met anytime. Why do I say this? To guilt us? No, 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 no. I, I don't say this for you to feel guilty. There's, no, there's, no, there's not a sin to have things. It's, it's, in fact, it's a blessing of God. I, am, I, I count it an incredible blessing of God that I was born when I was, to whom I was, raised the way that I was, had the opportunity that I was. It is an incredible gift of God, a blessing of God. However, we have to recognize that with the blessing comes an obstacle. Like, that doesn't seem to make sense. Well, I think about my sight. A blind person doesn't have the obstacle. I mean, remember Jesus says, if you look at a woman lustfully, uh, you've committed adultery with her, a blind guy doesn't have to worry about it. He can still lust without having eyes, but he doesn't worry about looking at a woman lustfully, does he? There's an op- there is an obstacle to my vision that I have to, a uh, responsibility in the way that I use it. There is an obstacle to our wealth, and there's a responsibility in the way that we use it. Okay, so It's not right or wrong. It just is what it is. We're born where we are. I say all this for one purpose is to, to point out what was Jesus really trying to say. And we need to make sure we're aware of it because he was speaking to us. As much as we want to write it off as somebody, you know, most of us define rich as somebody who has more money than us. I mean, right? That's... But he was speaking to us. This is what he was identifying. In fact, we see it because that, his teaching on that was a response to this rich young guy who came up, came up and said, hey, I want to follow Jesus. And Jesus said, okay, do good things. And he said, okay, I'm paraphrasing a little. He says, I do good things. He says, okay, now sell everything you have, come follow me. And then he says, I'll pass. What he's pointing out is this, the, the danger and the obstacle of self-reliance. We live in a nation that was built on self-reliance. Our biggest holiday, uh, our national holiday is Independence Day. Or you could rephrase it as self-reliance day. And you know what? There's value in that. I get that. But, but Jesus is saying, it, 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 when we, this idea of self-reliance is dangerous to our Christian walk. It is dangerous to, to us in experiencing, it's an obstacle in experiencing the fullness of Christ that he has for us. And so, so what do we do with that? Does that mean, okay, I just need to, I need to be poor. I'm going to sell everything. I'm going to quit my job, and I'm just going to be poor for the kingdom of God. Glory to Jesus. Amen. No, that's not, that's not the, the what When I see in Scripture, I see, when I look at Scripture, I think the greatest picture, the greatest way that we can learn about what it means to be completely dependent on God in prayer is not by looking at a specific verse, but it's about looking at the men, and, and actually particular men in this one, looking at the individuals who lived it. So I want, I want to look at a couple of guys. When I think about being completely dependent on God in prayer, I think of three guys. I think of Abraham, Moses, and David. I think of Abraham. Abraham was a man who was, guess what, wealthy. I mean, super rich. He was a super rich guy. And uh, he had all kinds of stuff. And yet what we see in, in Abraham is this incredible dependency on God. Where did that come from? It, it, his dependency on God wasn't tied to his bank account. His dependency on God was tied to his obedience. You see, God spoke to Abraham, just, just an average guy. He said, Abraham, I want to make you great. In fact, I'm going to send you to a place that, that I will eventually tell you where you're going. Could you imagine if you're, you're praying, you're in your quiet time, you're praying, God, what do you have for me today? And God says, well, I want you to pack up everything you have, put it into a U-Haul, and start driving. I'll tell you where to go as soon as you get out of town. This is essentially what God said to Abraham, and Abraham said, for real? 
Okay. There, there's a dependency on God. Could you imagine now, when you get outside the city limits, what happens to your self-reliance? Could you imagine the type of prayer that would have been uttered from Abraham's mouth after he told his family his plans and, and, and obediently followed God wherever he called him? He didn't have to, to hear a great sermon about prayer. There was an element of obedience that drove him to his knees and said, God, in this moment now, I need you more than ever. Need is an incredible catalyst to our prayer lives. Or how about, how about Moses? Moses was another guy. Maybe didn't have the financial affluence. He did it one, one time when he was young, but then became a, a farmer, or a shepherd, sorry. A meager life, but then God promoted him. So he wasn't necessarily wealthy, particularly in financially, but rather in, in, in power and influence. He was the leader of the people of Israel. And yet that didn't go to his head. It didn't it, it turn into this thing of self-reliance where now I'm, the, now I'm the president, I'm the king, I'm the one in charge. And I'm going to tell you, no, no, no. There was this, this dependency on God. Remember, he go, God comes to him and says, Moses, I want to use you. Moses, I want you to go back into your past and deal with undealt with issues. And Moses says, no thanks. God said, no, for real. I've, I've got, you are going to free my people Israel. And he said, no, really, I'm not. Moses, you're going to go, but listen, I will be with you. And he says, okay, God, if you will be with me, I will go. He didn't want to go. He had no desire to go, but his obedience drove him to dependency on God. So when he walked in, he says, God, what are you going to do next? See, so often we walk into a situation and we ask, okay, what am I going to do next? It's natural human tendency. And yet, there's this element, if we want to develop our, our relationship with God and in prayer, it happens through not just learning the right prayer tactics, it happens with learning obedience, and, and as we obediently follow God wherever he leads, he will inevitably lead you somewhere where you are uncomfortable. He will inevitably lead you somewhere that, that, that is deeper than you want to go. We love like hanging out and splashing in the kiddie pool, don't we? Where my feet can touch the ground, right? And get dunked by the, the bully, but it, whatever, I can stand up and be just fine. What we don't like is to tread out where our, the ground slips away and I'm bobbing and I can't swim. And yet time and time and time and time again, as you look at this book, you read the heroes of faith, and guess what they all have in common? God called them into waters that were deeper and rougher than they could handle themselves, and God showed up. And we see this dependency on God. David. David was a man of action, wasn't he? He was a passionate warrior. He, he was a lover of God and, and a worshiper. And he, he was the builder of, of the kingdom, Israel, God's kingdom at that time. And, and man, he was a man of action. And, and, and he did what God wanted, and, and yet he, there's humility in him. But you know what's interesting? I, I think we learned this lesson more from David's fault than his strength in this, this particular text. You see, in... In 2 Samuel 11, there's a story. It's, unfortunately for David, it's one of the more popular David stories. The story of David and Bathsheba. You remember the story? David is, is, is out on a rooftop, and he sees a beautiful woman bathing. He's like, yep, got to have that. And he does, and it all falls apart. Um, he ends up conspiracy and murdering her husband, and it's just a big mess. But you know what, what leads to his failure in that moment? Uh, let me read you verse 11. This is right before this, this happened. It says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David remained in Jerusalem. <laughs> verse 2. One evening, David got up from his bed. Evening, he got up from his bed. He just got up from a big old fat nap. 
And he walked around on the roof of his palace. See, in the time and the season of life when he was supposed to be active in the kingdom of God work, he was at home resting. And this is when I go back to what I stated early on, what I've experienced from high school till today. Listen, too much activity. And when I say activity, there's a difference between spiritual, kingdom building, God honoring activity and busyness. Okay? My life can get busy and it's not God honoring activity. Okay? So the, the, I'm, I'm differentiating there. But, but when, when my life is filled with God honoring kingdom building activity, that's when my prayer life is strong because I find myself in waters deeper than I can handle. And I have no choice but to call on the only one who has answers. When I find myself idle, when I have time to spare, when I'm not engaging in kingdom work, guess what happens to my, my prayer time? And yet so often, we as Christians, we settle. We talk about this in week one. We settle for these, these mediocre, average lives. As long as I can be average, as, as long as I can be a good person and not do bad things and go to church, and then I'll try to work on this whole Bible and prayer thing. No wonder your prayer life stinks. You're not doing anything for the kingdom of God. You've got the money to make yourself comfortable and the inactivity to not need anything else. And we leave, live these mediocre average, self-reliant Christian lives, and we wonder why we don't know how to pray. It's because we don't need God. He kind of set me up and gave me a boost, and now I'm just going to throw it on cruise control. I'm trying to pray with fervency, but I guess I just don't need anything. See, in this series, we've uncovered a few truths about living this abundant life, this fullness of life. That Jesus said, he came that we could have this fullness, this richness, this abundance. It's about being in Christ. Not just having a little bit of Jesus mixed in, but it's about being in Christ. And what does that look like? Being in Christ means that we are personally invested in making disciples of all nations. It means that when we signed up to be a part of the family of God, and we were adopted into the family of God, we are simultaneously enlisted into the army of God. That when Jesus called Peter, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It was one in the same calling. You come follow me. Jesus said, my mission, the reason I came was to seek and to save that which was lost. If we are in him, then, and, then that becomes our mission too. That we were saved with a purpose of reaching the people that Jesus loves. This is what it means to be in Christ. We expand that to know that Jesus said, what you do to the least of these, you've done unto me. So if we are in Christ, we are, we are, we are, we are taking on his mission, but we're also loving the unlovable. We're seeing the needs around us. We're getting our eyes off of ourselves, and we're beginning to see the people and the needs around us. And God says, man, I've put you there to meet those needs. And here's the beautiful thing. We get to do two things at once. Because as we begin to meet needs, we begin to open doors. Open doors of receptivity into people's lives. And we get to open doors by meeting needs and share the gospel, the love of Christ. And we get to be active in what God is doing in and around us. Being in Christ means that we are we are dedicated to the study of God's word for the purpose of living it. It means that day after day after day, I hold up this word, not as just a filter to, 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 to see my life through, but rather the very foundation upon which my life grows up out of. This is, uh, drives us to action. And if we skip those three steps, I then just say, I want to pray with fervency. You are kidding yourself. Because we just don't have that kind of need. I don't need God unless I'm willing to follow him into the deep end. So here's, here's, here's the two-part deal on this prayer thing. On one hand, we need to learn to pray with discipline. Just like this is what needs to happen. This is a value of God, so I will schedule it into my life, and I will show up, and I will do it, because I believe the long-term effects of doing healthy things every day. I believe in that. 
I believe in doing little things every day to make my life healthy. Right? I believe in it in my physical health. I believe in it in my spiritual health. So I would be disciplined, and I'll do this in my, in my prayer life. At the same time, a prayer life needs to be disciplined, but it needs to be dependent. And dependency in your prayer life is contingent upon your obedience in your everyday life. So you want to learn, the, the people who I know who pray with the greatest, greatest fervency are the people that I know who are the most active daily in the kingdom of God and what he's doing around them. I mean, with zero exception. The people who have those dynamic prayer lives that say, I want to be like that. They're just gifted. So I can't. I can't be like that because they're, they're like that and I'm not wired that way and I can't pray. God's saying, cut that out. Be disciplined in your prayer life and be obedient in the way that you live your life for me. And you will find a fervency. You know why? Because <laughs> you're going to get scared. Because <laughs> he's going to call you to things that you can't do. He's going to lead you places where you can't touch the bottom. He's going to call you to engage in activity where if God doesn't show up, you're going to fall flat on your face. In fact, that's a question that I ask myself regularly. And every time I do, I hate, I hate it. <laughs> Is when was the last time I prayed a prayer that if God didn't show up, I would fall flat on my face? Because here's the deal, we love praying easy prayers. Like, God, heal my daughter of a cold. Like, God made our human bodies. She will eventually get healed. Most of us. With modern medicine and just most colds go away. It's an easy prayer. When was the last time I prayed a prayer that literally, if God doesn't alter the law of, of, of nature, it doesn't happen. See, I want, I want to follow God into the deep end. I made a statement kind of on accident in the last service. I said, I, I, I pray, God, bring us into the deep. God is not going to bring you into the deep end. He'll invite you, though. And I believe God is inviting you and me to be active in his work around us. And what is going to take place is your prayer life will begin to flourish. Not because you willed it to do so, because you didn't have any other choice. So, so how deep are you willing to go? Where's your comfort level? I want to invite you today. You want, you want to experience richness in your prayer life. Take another step in obedience to God. In fact, there's a good chance it's probably in one of the areas that we've already talked about. Maybe in another area. It, it, for some of you, God is calling you. There's people in your life that you know are, 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 are dying and going to hell apart from Christ. And God has put them in your life. And he's called you to be a door opener, to, to, to create opportunities, to share the love of Jesus. And, and, and you've been living in self-preservation and mediocrity. God says, take a risk. For some of you, you live and you see need around you. And listen, we are all going to see need around us if we're, if we're willing to look. But here's the problem with looking, and this is why a lot of us don't look at the need around us, is because it's so overwhelming we don't know what to do. Some of the problems that our world faces, some of the problems that our families face, they're, 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 they're unsolvable problems. And God has called us to jump in with both feet right into the middle of the problems and the mess of the world that we live in today. And he says, you go meet a need. And what's going to happen is you're going to say, God, I can't meet this need. And he says, you just follow me and I'll show you where it is. For some of you, it's, it's, it's all about... It's all about alignment with his word. And there's certain things in here you're like, I'm just, I'm a little too afraid to put this into practice. I'm a little too afraid to, to, to put this risk out there. I'm not really sure if I have to or if I can't or I'm not really sure if I want to follow. And God is calling you to take steps of obedience and alignment to the person of Jesus Christ. And as you do, and as you risk, and as you put yourself out there, you're going to see something take place. In your fear, in your need, there is, there's going to be a fervency in your prayer.
we discipline ourselves. Keep showing up. You can't have both. If you have just, if you have just the, if you have just the, the discipline, then you're gonna, you're gonna lack authenticity. If you have just the dependency, then you're gonna lack stability. You, you kind of have to have the whole discipline and de, de, uh, dependency thing both. But what, what I want to encourage us, and because it's passionate to me, because this is what God is showing me this week is that I struggle in this area. And it's not because I don't have the right tools. It's because I don't have enough obedience. I want to put it on the line. Because what in the world am I hanging on to it for? My time, my energy, my finance, yeah, my money. My money. I want to put it on the line. I want to put it on everything on the line. follow him into the deep end and pray like crazy I'll keep my head above water <laughs> and he might not but to God be the glory I'm going to follow where you lead you want to see your prayer life thrive church let's live in obedience no matter what and let's follow him where he leads us. God, we praise you. We thank you for your word to us today. We praise you. We